Okay, today we're going to try something different. This was suggested to me because a friend heard me making fun of people who were posting on one of the subreddits and suggested going down the first couple of pages of the Overwatch University subreddit and answering the questions in the threads there. Why not? It's like, it's like having a question and answer segment without having to go through the hassle of actually collecting any questions. How about that? So we'll give it a try. We'll see how it is. So, first off, is Bridget undertuned or am I expecting too much? I mean, they nerfed her, so... It already seems as if they don't think she's undertuned, at least. The thing is, the PTR is largely a complete waste of time, because the people who play on the PTR are not taking it that seriously. So it doesn't really... We don't know. Until she actually gets to live, we won't really know. So, we'll see. How to tilt the enemy. Now, there's a great many ways to tilt the enemy, but this person means strictly through in-game mechanics, which is a little bit more limited. The most basic way to tilt the enemy is just to hard focus one person in particular. As I, pre I recommend, if you see, like, a Genji, a Widowmaker, a Hanzo, a Mercy, you just hard focus that person, and that will tilt them. Doesn't even matter who you are. Just, like, hard focus them. Another classic example is teabagging them after you kill them. I mean, even though it's like the juvenile way to do it, the person that you do it to absolutely always goes, fucking really, dude? And they get upset about it. And that's how you tilt them like that there. And uh, solo ulting someone is also always a good one. Now, that does carry the risk that you have to use your ult on one person, which will not always be great. But if you're playing Reinhardt and you solo ult someone... They will be upset about it, almost regardless of who they are. But basically, you hard focus one dude, and you will tilt that person. Somber questions. There are several somber questions. In a team fight, should I stay with my team and get a few hacks in in front of the enemy, or should I try to get behind the enemy t team to kill the supports, even knowing my team will kind of have to 5v6 them? The general way Sombra is is that hacking people is more important than shooting people, usually. But if there's nobody around that's, like, a great hack target, I mean, it might be better to do that. Like, I suppose, if there's, like, extreme example, if there's, like, Widowmaker Hanzo, hacking them doesn't really do very much. So I guess in that situation, it probably doesn't really matter that much. But with Sombra, hacking somebody is usually a lot more important than actually, like, firing the gun, because being hacked is, like, actually crippling for so many heroes in the game. Mostly tanks. No tank likes getting hacked, and quite a lot of DPS don't like getting hacked either. If I'm on one side of the payload and an enemy is on the other side of the payload, does the Emp go through the payload? No, it does not. Get above the payload before you do that. When is the best time to amp? Right at the start of the team fight when your whole team is there. Like, basically right right as soon as your team or their team has committed to the team fight, you amp, like, right at the start. And, um, that's basically, like, you just really want to get it in there before anybody has any chance to, like, activate any of their ults, because then they can't activate any of their ults. And, um... You want to make sure that, like, your team is actually committed to the fight, or the enemy team is actually committed to the fight, but, like, right as soon as they commit, basically. Should I try and hack most of the health packs near the enemy spawn, or should I go for the ones that are near the point? Hacking the ones near the enemy spawn is largely irrelevant, except um, if they have a Sombra as well, because then the Sombra, their Sombra can't use them. But the ones near the point are more important. In general, denying the enemy team health packs doesn't really amount to very much because uh, if they have to go, if the, like the enemy team has to go out of their way to get to one of their the health kits, they were probably just resetting anyway at that point because it sounds like both of their healers were already dead if they needed to go out of their way to get a health kit. Capturing the ones that are near the point or near your team are much more important because the enemy team typically cares less. Um, unless they have a Sombra, in which case their Sombra will be very upset about it. Also, if you're using one of the health kits back there, fair enough, but broadly speaking, the ones near the point and near your team will be more important. What health pack should I hack on cough maps, and where should I place my translocator on cough maps? The ones that are closest to the point, and you should... Like, you're gonna go through the general Sombra loop of hack health kit, put translocator there, go out and flank, but... 
just um, vary up the ones that you're using, because if you keep working off of the same health kit over and over again, the enemy team are going to get wise to where you're going and where you're coming from, and then they're going to be ready for you. You're not going to be as unpredictable, and they might just come over and kill you. So you va- you want to vary it up, but the ones that are closest to the point, basically, without being, like, you know, directly in front of the point or something like that. If... I emp an enemy and immediately hack him after that. Does the hack time stack, or does the normal hack replace the emped hack time? No effect like that actually stacks. They always replace the other one, so it effectively refreshes the duration on the hack. So when you emp, if you're going to hack somebody, you want to wait, like, a few seconds, and basically, like, as close to when the emp hack would wear off as possible, then you hack him again, and it stacks on top of each other. Like, if you see, like, Zarya has got her ultimate, and you emped them, you just watch Zarya, count down, like, a couple seconds, then hack her again, reset the duration. Effects like that never stack. Ryan versus Ryan, we both have ult and shield up. How do I behave? Do not lower shield. And then the thing that uh, it talks about is, like, lowering and raising your shield to bait the person out. I sometimes do that, but, um... Depending on, like, your latency, it might not always work out, so... The the thing is with, like, the other Reinhardt usually baits himself. I know this is how I am. Like, the Reinhardt players are really good at baiting themselves into using their, um, Earth Shatter badly. So, if if you just kind of, like, stare at him for a really long time, he's gonna get increasingly desperate, and then he's gonna try and perform a worse Earth Shatter. Um, like, it, it's more important that you don't let him earth shatter your team than you earth shattering their team. Because, like, yeah, alright. If you earth shatter their team, you might win the fight. If the, if you let him earth shatter your team, you threw the game. Right? It is more important that you block the earth shatter than anything else. If you think you can try and bait it out of him, go for it. But, um, the, there is a, heavy price to pay if you fuck it up. Mo- a lot of Reinhardt players will start, like, running into the other dude and swinging their hammer, and then, like, swing shield up, because, like, the thought process being, if this guy's swinging into me, he's probably gonna keep swinging into me, but, again, if you fuck it up, there's a heavy price to pay. It's more important you block his than anything else. What abilities can stop Moira's Coalescence? Any one of the ones that is a hard crowd control effect. So, flashbang, hook... Hacking, Emp, Earth Shatter, Trank, May Freezing You. Is that it? I guess if Hanzo killed you, right, with Scatter Arrow? <laughs> um, it's any of the ones that are a hard crowd control effect. Anything that, like, takes control away from the player is generally going to do it. Um, is that really all of the hard crowd control effects in the game? I feel like I'm forgetting something. I tell you what we'll do. We'll go over here. We'll do some uh, some research live on the air. Overwatch hero list. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I also can't think of another one that has a hard crowd control effect. Doomfist knockback. Right. So Doomfist's punch, flashbang, hack, may freezing you, earth shatter, hook, sleep. Oh, Bridget's stun as well. Bridget's uh, shield black bash is gonna interrupt. Um, yeah, that's it. Any and the hack. Any hard crowd control effects of which there are not very many. The most unusual ones are like um, Doomfist punch and Bridget's shield bash. Uh, so. How do I learn five heroes at once? You don't. You absolute madman. Like. Learning five heroes at the same time is actually madness. Like, maybe if you're trying to learn heroes that are, like, adjacent to each other and what they do. Like, if you're learning how to play Soldier, you are kind of learning how to play McCree by extension. But they both still play pretty differently at the same time, even though they're, like, adjacent to each other in role. So, you really don't, like, pick a hero and then just like focus on playing that hero and learning how to play that hero. For some people it's easier. I guess if you were like really good at picking things up quickly, you could try and learn a few at once, but like Jesus Christ, you madman, just like be a little bit more contained, try and learn one at a time instead. It's better to be really good at a couple of things than to be mediocre at a lot of things. 
If I'm playing Ryan and Orisa, how do I move relative to my team? So I took this as being very broad, so I looked at it, and they talk about if non-flanker DPS runs way past my shield, do I go out to save them? If they're doing something stupid, that's their own decision to make, right? If you can try and save the person, yeah, alright, like if you see like you're on so like Volskaya Industries and you watch your soldier run out of the choke point and then start hobbling back towards you. All right, take like a couple steps forward and try and put the shield in front of the guy. But if they run like way out of position, you are under no obligation to try and fix that boy's mistake and like pro probably kill yourself at the same time. If they're fucking up, like there are limited options for you to f save them. Um, there is this, th there's this, like, psychological effect that Reinhardt can have on people specifically, where if you walk in front of them, and put the shield in front of them, and then start walking backwards, they tend to follow you, because you just sort of scoop them up and start walking back. They tend to follow you back, because psychologically, like, they're like, oh yeah, shields are nice, and they follow you back. Not always, but, like, I've noticed that tends to happen. If you can reasonably try and save them, sure, but don't feel no obligation to risk kill killing yourself or the, your team to try and fix somebody's mistake. If they fucked up, they fucked up. You've got limited options. Is there anything you can do when your team keeps dying during regrouping and you're spawn trapped? Why well, you can try and tell them to stop going out and getting fucking murdered, but that's going to vary heavily depending on your team. If it's like one person or two people are predominantly responsible for the reason you're spawn trapped, you can try changing to their counter and then like going out a different exit and trying to kill that person. Um, but otherwise, you're pretty. It's gonna depend a lot on what your team wants you to wants to do, basically. Um, if you have like a particularly powerful ultimate, you might be able to just kind of like grind out the charge for it and use it to like tip it back. But like. It's going to really depend on how stupid your own teammates are, more than anything else. Should you ever pulse bomb a Farah? I mean, if you're on the if the Farah is on the ground right next to you, I don't see why not. The whole benefit of the pulse bomb is that it's a uh, basically a guaranteed pick on a sticky tar uh, pick on a squishy target, not a sticky target. Um, a squishy target like if the far is like on the ground next to you and you think killing the far is particularly important right now, by all means do it. If the far is like fucking floating around in the air, don't. Like it's not worth the effort of trying to do it with Tracer's weak fucking underarm lob, but if she's just kinda on the ground and you're there, I don't see why not, if you think the far is important. Quick play advice. Now my gut reaction was just don't play quick play. But it's like a whole thing and like the point of it is basically, like, being nervous about playing games and what do you do about that and blah, 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 blah. Um, and if that ever subsides or stuff like that. I was at one point in my time, like, uh, one point in time, like, nervous about playing, like, ranked modes because I had, like, the anxiety around it. Eventually, I just kind of stopped caring. Um, played League of Legends for, like, seven years and, like, it was uh, worse for that, because basically I was afraid of finding out I wasn't as good as I think I am. And if you just kind of like force yourself to do it, eventually you aren't as bothered by it, basically. You just kind of get used to it. At least in my experience, it's going to vary from person to person probably, but in my experience, if you just kind of like push through the initial part, um, you get better. It gets better. Um, real practical advice for playing Moira, I've, I've read this as a question once before, but it's just like, basically, oh, if you play Moira, you gotta actually fucking heal people. Yeah, no shit. You know, you're playing a healer. If they're just going around right-clicking people all the time, whatever, right? Like, yeah, she's a fucking healer. Heal people. Is this a common or a me problem? So, when I play in High Silver and I find that sometimes the most effective way to counter a Farah is just to get a good Farah of your own. This is a surprisingly common opinion that I've seen people have, that the, a way, the way to counter another Farah is just to have a better Farah. This is not really true. Now, there is, there is this sort of thing you can get into with the other Farah, where there's, kind of, there's like a dominance thing with Farahs, right? Where they want to try and kill the other Farah. Thing is, it's really hard for one Farah to kill the other Farah, unless she's an absolute fucking god, or one Farah is just positioning really badly. 
So, I mean, in one way, if you're kind of, like, hanging out next to the other Farah, she's gonna try and kill you, and you can just, like, focus on the people on the ground who are actually, like, easy to hit, and then their Farah is doing nothing trying to kill you while you're actually fighting the rest of their team, kind of making it a 6v5 in a way. Um, no, Farah, like, this is a surprisingly common opinion that people have, like, it's not true. Like, if you want to counter Farah, you should just, like, pick one of the, um, hitscan DPS and harass her, or pick D.Va and just make her very sad, basically. Is it worth learning Anna? Not really. Um, Anna's, like, the worst support currently. There are situations in which Anna is very good. Um, for example, if your team relies heavily around a Graviton combo, like Barrage, uh, or Dragon Blade, Graviton, and they have a Zenyatta, if you pick Ana, that makes it easier to perform that combo, because the, the Zenyatta is going to use Transcendence in the Graviton, but if you throw your grenade into the Graviton, Zen Transcendence doesn't do anything anymore. So Anna is very good in certain niche scenarios, but broadly speaking, you're better off learning to play basically any other support in the game currently, because Anna is very weak right now compared to the other support. She is good in niche situations, but she isn't worth learning if you have no familiarity with her. So Anna questions right after that. If I'm playing far back as Anna and I'm constantly struggling with getting flanked, do I start playing closer to my team? Yes, you... If you can't deal with the flanker yourself, you need your team to help you, basically. Uh, if my team, though, if the enemy team is playing something very dive heavy, you might not want to do that, because if you're, like, close to your team and the enemy team just suddenly, like, pushes right in on top of you and you're playing Anna, you're going to be upset about it. Um, but if you're being flanked and you can't deal with the flanker, go closer to your team. If my team is consistently, constantly blocking each other from getting healed and I can't get to high ground, what do I do? Well, you can try and move closer to them because then you can sort of, like, poke around, like, move around the side of them and stuff like that. If it's, like, a really urgent scenario, you can just throw the grenade in there at people to heal them up if it's, like, kind of an emergency situation. If, um, if it's not particularly urgent, you can just kind of, like, sit back and, like, take the extra couple of seconds to, like, actually get them if nothing particularly urgent is happening at the time. Um, doesn't usually happen that much, honestly, because most teams, it's pretty rare for a team to actually be, like, right on top of each other constantly, so I don't think that's, like, a particularly common issue that you'd really run into. Tips on hitting sleep on Tracer slash Genji. Pray. If there is a 3v5 on Koth, but we have Nanoblade, do I save for the next fight or try to use it during that fight to try and win it? If the Genji pulls Dragon Blade, yes. If not, no. If the Genji pulls out the Dragon Blade, then at that point you might as well do it, because you will build up another Nano Boost before he builds up another Dragon Blade anyway. So if he commits his Dragon Blade, you might as well commit your Nano Boost to him as well, because you'll get it back by the time he has his next ability, his next Nano Blade. But don't try and like force it on him, because also if you're not both on the same page and you Nano Boost him like as he's leaving, he's gonna be like, oh fuck, and suddenly has to go back in and completely reassess things. Things. So if he pulls it out, sure. If not, no. Nah, just wait till the next fight instead and then use it there instead. In general, using committing ultimates to a, a lopsided fight is a bad idea because it has to go really well for it to swing the fight back in your favor. So I wouldn't opt into it unless you have to, basically. Or if it, if it's the last fight as well, like you're not going to have time to regroup, by all means, just put it right on top of him right there. But assuming you've still got time to regroup and try again, just wait, unless he pulls out the blade. Better to stay back, far back scoped in or just quick, quick scope to heal all the time. This seems to be a preference thing with Ana players. I spend very little time looking down my scope, but I've seen like a lot of Ana players that spend a lot of time scoped in. So it seems to largely be preference, but um, I recommend being scoped as little as possible so you have a wider field of view, basically. Um, is it better to use Bionate to boost heals or on an enemy team? And when should I ever use it to self-heal? You should only use it to self-heal if there's no other healer or you think you might die if you don't heal right now. Um, or, like, if your healer's, the other healer's coming back or something like that. If, if you think you're at risk of dying, just do it. 
Um, if there's no other healer, you're going to have to use your own grenade to heal, your, to heal you a few times. Like, that's just kind of how it is. But basically, uh, only in like dire situations do you really want to do that. As for be better to boost heals or on an enemy, ideally you can do both, but that's not always realistic. I'm of the mindset that it's more important to keep your own team alive than try and kill the enemy team. Because it's really, really easy to hit your own team. It can be quite difficult to hit the enemy team, so... I think it's usually, if you have to pick one or the other, it's going to generally be better to heal your own team. Though there are times when it will be really impactful to stop healing on the other person. Like, if they nano boost their Reinhardt, for example, if they nano boost anybody, really, putting the grenade on the person that got nano boosted is going to really fuck that person up, because if they got nano boosted, they're going to go in really hard right there and then. So if they can't get healed while they're going in really hard, then it's much easier to kill them even through the nano boost. But generally, it'll be better to heal, boost your heals on your own team than the enemy team if you have to pick one or the other. Ideally, you can do both, though. Like, um, if you can get, like, your Reinhardt and their Reinhardt, for example, with the grenade, you probably just won that fight off of that alone. Like, it's that impactful. Because suddenly, your Reinhardt basically can't die, and their Reinhardt is basically sentenced to death. In a close 1v1 range, should I try still try to quickscope or just, or just shoot no scope? Again, it seems to be largely preference, bearing in mind that when you're scoped in, it's a hit scan weapon, and when you're unscoped, it's a projectile weapon, so it'll largely depend on which type of um, weapon you're more comfortable using. I'm more comfortable using hit scan weapons than projectile, but that'll vary depending on person. How do I get better Widow Aim? Play a lot of Widowmaker. There's really no, no other way to it. There's, um, you know, there's like advice like turn down your sensitivity really low and, um, all the various like training warm up things people recommend. When it comes right down to it though, the way you get better at aiming on any hero is you just play a lot of that hero. And it's not what anyone wants to hear and it's not what anyone wants to do because you have to suffer through this very long period of being bad at it. But, eventually you get better at it like there's no other there's no way around it right like you do eventually just have to grind it out so that you build up the muscle memory so that your no hand knows how to click on the man in a way that it kills them that's just how it is unfortunately uh let's see vod requesting advice never mind at what point do you give up on a hero if you want to play the hero don't give up on the hero like there are, there are going to be points where it's hard especially if the hero is hard to play like like widowmaker you know People are going to be uh, shit-talking you, and you're probably going to be beating yourself up like, oh, I'm so bad, blah, 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 and your win rate's going to be bad, and you're going to feel bad. If you want to play Widowmaker, if you want to play Hanzo, if you want to play Doomfist, just play him. Like, don't give up on it if it's what you want to do, right? There's no hero in the game that is completely unusable, right? Like, if you want to play that hero... Just play the hero. Yeah, like, Doomfist is, like, the worst DPS. He's not unplayable. You just have to be, like, good at Doomfist to get anything out of him, right? Is Anna's, like, the worst support right now. Anna's not unplayable. Like, like you just have to be good at Anna. So, if you want to play the hero, don't give up on the hero. Just play the hero. Uh, if you want to play him, you should never give up on him. If you decide that, like, you start playing him and you're like, oh, this isn't quite what I thought it was, or I'm not having fun with this hero, then okay. But if you want to play the hero, just play the hero. Don't give up on it. Uh, too many support players? Absolutely not. Why do I feel like the moment I die, we lose the point? Because your team is fighting 5v6. It's very hard to win a fight where you already numbers disadvantage. So, if you died first, yeah your team was having to fight 5v6 after that. And that can be really crippling depending on what you are. Like, if you're the main healer and you die and they're left with, like, a Zenyatta, that's going to be really fucking hard. If you're the main tank and you die, that's really fucking hard. If you're, like, the... If you're a soldier and the other DPS is, like, Mei, it's going to be really hard because then they don't have that much damage left there anymore. It's hard to win a fight 5v6. So if you die first, you are probably going to lose the point, of assuming the enemy team capitalizes on it correctly. Is it worth talking in voice chat? In my experience, no. I gave up on that shit a long time ago. Because, like, here's how it is, right? And for the record, I literally never use the voice chat, and I got to Masters, no problem. So it's not as big of a deal as people make it out to be. Here's my experience with voice chat. 
If your team is winning, no communication happens anyway, because your team is winning, and therefore communication is not really that important. If you are on the losing team, your team is usually just getting upset that they're losing, and therefore not actually communicating meaningfully anyway. And also, the Overwatch community is fucking awful. Like, actually one of the worst communities I've ever been a part of. No. Like, if you, f if, like, if you can endure voice chat, great for you. If you're, like, a charismatic person and have no trouble, like, talking to people and shot calling or whatever, by all means. But, like, in my experience, no. It's not worth talking in voice chat. And no, you don't have to talk in voice chat. If voice chat makes you uncomfortable or, like, for whatever reason, or you just don't want to use it, do not feel pressured to use it. I do not... I never talk in voice chat. Never. And if people ask, try and get me in the voice chat, I just flatly go, no. I don't want to talk to you, and you don't want to talk to me. I got to Masters. No problem. Don't feel pressured. In my experience, no. It's not worth it. Your experience may vary. Um, how are placement ma matches measured exactly? From my experience, it looks like they're just matches that are weighed more heavily on your SR. Like, they seem to be equivalent to, like, three or four ranked games compared to a regular game but like they aren't they aren't as big of a deal as um they might appear to be it's, it just seems like they're more heavily weighted matches than usual which i mean like you know obviously can't get better is there a question in here really or is it just kind of like really vague i mean the thing is like it never really feels like you're getting better when you're actually playing the game right because it's it's um it's one of those things where it's hard to measure your own growth because, like, as you get better, you climb, so you're playing against people who are better as well, so you never really reach a point that you're just, like, schooling people, right? So it never really feels, like, from your perspective, it's never really going to feel like you're getting that much better. I mean, this is, this is the way, it's, like, if you start working out, right, like, you don't notice every single centimeter increase in muscle mass, right? You, like, uh, for a while, you look at yourself and you go, whoa! I am so much healthier than I was previously, right? Like, eventually you just kind of look back and you're like, wow, I have improved a lot. It's very hard to actually perceive improvement as it's happening. So it's never really going to feel like you're improving at the time. You'll just eventually look back and be like, oh, wow, I've gotten a lot better. Uh, mostly, so there's the little things. This is not really a question. When should I play Doomfist? Ho ho ho! Ha ha ha! Oh, funny joke. If you want to play Doomfist, play Doomfist. But, um, the only, like, objective thing that Doomfist has over other people is he can traverse the map very fucking quickly because he has nothing but movement abilities. Oh, excuse me. Jesus. Um, if you want to play him, by all means play him. But, um, there's no, like, real big thing that he has over anybody else, so it basically just has to be you want to play Doomfist. Uh, what percentage of damage healed is a sign of a great healer, or on the other hand, does it even matter? Not really, because the that's going to vary so much from game to game. I've seen games where, like, 7k healing was like 50% of damage healed, right? Like, the, the numbers can be so heavily skewed in any particular game. If you are reliably getting the percentage healed card at the end of the game you're probably pretty good at healing people but honestly no the only stat i think that it is really worth tracking at all is deaths because those are the things that are ha or will always have an objective improvement by lowering the stat right if you die less you are objectively playing better as a result of that so that's the only thing that i think matters strat stat tracking wise any GM plus tracers with, with basically with like medium ping, probably. Um, probably not many, but uh, there's probably a couple. Uh, so there's this thing about high, this sensitivity as well. And it was like, how low should I be? Blah, 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 blah. My sensitivity is li literally four. <laughs> like four with, what's the DPI? 2,400 DPI. It's quite low. Um, you're generally very low sensitivity is better than very high sensitivity. Um, how do you counter D.Va? This was a very surprising one to me, because it's just like, they're very upset about D.Va. Um, pick Zarya. Um, pick May, if you're really, really upset at the D.Va, I suppose. Um, the way, like, the real way that you deal with D.Va is there's that you kind of don't, um... 
Like the thing that Diva does is she punishes people for being out of position, and she dives on people and she makes them panic, and she does this like big burst of damage on people who are like out of position. As long as people, as long as like people are close together, Diva doesn't get anything done. So if she's like she's killing you specifically, you just play closer to your team because then she's gonna like get killed as soon as she goes into the entire enemy team, right? Um, you can put you can just play people that like are good against Diva, like um, like Zarya, like May. Um, McCree is good against Diva because head she's very easy to headshot in mech and then flashbang kills her out of mech. Soldier's very good against Diva because if she dives on you and you put the biotic field down, you can usually just fight her in the biotic field. Unless the Diva's really good at tracking, she isn't going to kill you through the biotic field usually. Uh, there will be a point where she can consistently do that, but like, you can usually just fight the Diva in the biotic field. So, And Soldier can just like farm a lot of ult charge off of Diva because she's very big, she's very easy to hit. She's one of those heroes that can be an ult battery for the enemy team. And if she tries to dive on you and you're playing Soldier, you can just leave. Um, basically, the way you play D the Counter Diva is just by, like, not being out of position and getting picked off. And if she's really causing you trouble, you can just pick, like, the people that really fuck up D.Va. Um, Roadhog can, like, fuck up D.Va because you, like... The thing is with this is that D.Va makes, it, uh, makes it hard to play Roadhog, but if, like, the D.Va is playing very aggressively and diving people, Roadhog is good against D.Va because then you see the D.Va dive in on somebody and you pull diva off of that person and like yeah you're probably not gonna kill diva really as long as she doesn't do something like really fucking stupid but you'll stop her from killing the person and like that's fine if like the diva is the issue you're losing because she's killing somebody else all the time roadhog stops it um tanks in general will make it difficult like you can just play reinhardt and like put your shield between the diva and the person right um basically but she's good at punishing people for being out of position and like doing a big burst of damage to them so you just kind of like stop her from doing that zarya as well you bubble the person she's diving most tanks in general will make it difficult for her to do that or just and if it's you dying just position better get good uh, let's see. Need help countering Sim in low ranks? Um, pick Winston. <laughs> there was slightly more to that. There was like, um, how do you quickly b destroy a teleporter or shield generator if you're a tank? To hope that you aren't the one that has to do it. Um, if you're playing Diva, you'll break it really quickly, but she's kind of, or Arissa, but if you're in a position to break it as Arissa, you're in a very strange situation. Diva can break the generator to teleport it very quickly. If you're playing Winston, just hope you aren't the one that has to do it because it's going to take you, but you're sitting there with like a practically sitting there with a fucking screwdriver taking it apart one screw at a time, right? Like just hope you don't have to do it if you're playing Winston. If you're playing Winston, the thing that you bring to countering um, Symmetra is that you break all her turrets and then you put the bubble on the Symmetra and you fight the Symmetra. You're not good at breaking the shield generator part, right? Or the teleporter part. You're good at killing Symmetra and her turrets. Not so much her ultimate. Diva is okay at breaking the turrets still. She won't do it as quickly as um, Winston, but she's still good at that. Fighting the Symmetra will be scarier because you can't block her and she will take you out of mech quite quickly at high charge. So fighting the Symmetra will be scarier, but you will be a lot better at breaking her ultimate. So um, basically... Uh, Pick one of those heroes, probably. If you're playing a DPS, pick McCree. Flashbang. All the turrets only got one hit point. Throw a flashbang into the nest. Phew, they're all gone. Flashbang Symmetra. Shoot that. Easy money. Um, should I learn Genji or Trace? E is right next to R. We'll forgive. Um, basically, it'll depend on your playstyle. Genji can be played in a more passive way than Tracer can. Tracer is a very aggressive hero. The whole thing she has is that she does a lot of damage. She's very mobile. So the thing is that you get... <clears throat> you get behind the enemy team and you pressure their backline a lot. Um, Genji can be played the same way, but you can also play Genji much more um, conservatively than that. There's like kind of two ways you play Genji. You, there's the one kind of Genji that is like always behind the enemy team, um, constantly trying to pressure people. But you can also play Genji with your own team because you have range on your weapon. Like, yeah, it's not a great long range weapon or anything, but you can poke people with Shuriken. And if you see an opportunity to kill somebody, you can dash in. Um, kill them and then dash back out again off the reset. And like these are two perfectly valid ways of playing Genji. And then both kind of also revolve around getting big plays with Dragon Blade. These are both perfectly valid ways of playing Genji. Uh, if you watch like uh, Siegel play Genji, he's always behind. He plays very aggressive Genji. If you watch um, Shatter 2K, he tends to play a much more passive style of Genji. And you can play both as well. I'm not saying you have to be one or the other, but it'll sort of depend on what you prefer, right? Like, I've seen Tracer players who kind of play, try and play really passively with their own team, kind of playing like I've just described Genji. It doesn't work so well with Tracer. It works better with Genji, so 
It'll depend on what you prefer, but like, eh, whichever you like. It doesn't really matter which one, they're both fine. Um, playing as Rhine tips, appreciated. Don't let him earth shatter you. Once you have built up earth, one, use fire strike to build up earth shatter, then stop using earth fire strike. Fire strike is for building up earth shatter. Uh, if you think you can kill somebody with fire strike, by all means do it, but once you've built up Earth Shatter, stop using Fire Strike at that point. It's not giving you anything anymore unless you kill the person. Um, if there's a Reinhardt on their team, don't let him Earth Shatter your team, and just wait for opportunities to slip the Earth Shatter past him. Remember that you are playing a tank and not a DPS. Blocking damage for your team and creating space for your team is more important than you doing damage. Um, Remember your tank. Uh, this is the one example I always give. Imagine you're fighting. Imagine you're playing Reinhardt, right? And you've got a soldier right next to you, and there's an enemy soldier that you're fighting. What most Reinhardt players try to do is run forward and hit the soldier, even though like that's hard for them to do. What you should actually do is just put your shield in front of your soldier because your soldier can't lose the fight anymore because the other soldier has no way to damage him. So your soldier wins by default. Remember, you're playing a tank, you're not playing a DPS. If you've got gold damage and eliminations, don't shit-talk your DPS for it, because that probably means that you're spending too much time being aggressive and not enough time actually making space for your team. So, uh, how do you kill Farah without aim? Play Winston or D.Va. Um, D.Va is better because she can fuck with Farah in more ways than Winston. They are both good at dealing with Farah because they both deal essentially guaranteed damage to the Farah. And D.Va has the added benefit of also being able to just completely eat Farah's ultimate. But you just pick those heroes, they, you just, your project, the projectile is your body. You just go up there and you fuck up the Farah, right? You just harass her. And you don't have to kill the Farah. You just have to do damage to the Farah, and then the Farah has to play passively and heal up. Or um, if you've got a DPS that can help as well, you doing that guaranteed, like, half damage to the Farah might be enough for the McCree to headshot her and finish her off, right? Um, those are, like, the easy ways to deal with Farah without, without aim. Just pick them. Just pick Far uh, Winston or D.Va. I recommend D.Va. Um, don't double dip. What do you mean by this exactly? I mean, in the middle of a team fight, Bro, if you throw out your yellow orb, well, who does that? Am I right? <laughs> Fucking, oh my god! <laughs> uh, take that time to refuel your biotic energy. If you throw a damage orb, as tempting as it is, don't start damn. Nah, I don't buy. I don't buy into this nonsense. Get out of my face. Is it uh, okay to deviate from my team comp to counter one enemy hero? If that enemy hero is particularly impactful, yes. Uh, like if if. Now, there's a caveat to this. If you're your team's only tank or your team's only healer, don't do that. But, <laughs> aside from that, by all means, if that one enemy hero is like what you think the reason you're losing the game is, absolutely, go for it. Uh, sound gurus, I want to upgrade my sound setup with a focus on competitive gaming. Help me upgrade, help me navigate these weird and expensive waters. Look, alright, I'm a complete audio file. Here's the thing doesn't matter. As long as you buy a surround sound headset, that is probably good enough. There is a very minimal difference between all of them, and you kind of have to, like, really be paying attention to really notice it, or have, like, a, a very keen ear for that kind of thing. It doesn't matter as long as it's a surround sound headset, usually. Don't buy, like, a fucking dollar store headset and expect it to be good. Like, obviously, like, not that extreme. As long as it's just, like, a decent headset with surround sound, it'll be fine. Preferably, it's noise canceling. Like these are. This is a noise canceling headset. It's like fifty dollars. It's like a Panasonic, like fifty dollar headset. It's fine. Um, it doesn't matter as much as people will make you believe it is. It matters to someone like me because I'm an audiophile. But it doesn't matter that much as long as it's a surround sound headset of reasonable quality. It, you won't notice the difference. Preferably, it's noise canceling. Doesn't really matter that much though. Movement tips. Does anyone have any good tips regarding movement? I know that AD spamming and crouch spamming are things to do, but when I do that, I feel like I get hit even more. But when I watch other people do it, it seems fluid and they seem so fluid and hard to hit. That's because they've practiced it. That's the thing. I'm bad at that because I don't really play the heroes that have to get into that kind of situation very often. Like if you play a soldier or a McCree, that's going to be more important for you because you might end up fighting the other soldier or McCree, in which case this will matter. But the, the reason it seems so much more fluid to them is just because they've practiced doing it. I have not had practice doing it, so I'm bad at doing it, even though, like, I'm a higher ranked player. I've not practiced it, so I won't seem fluid and natural doing it. It's just practice. That is the better way to duel somebody, 
but you just need to practice it until you actually like do it right because that's the this is the thing with any um competitive game in general you have to be comfortable navigating the space to really get anywhere right and you just kind of have to get used to controlling your character so you just have to practice this until it becomes a natural movement for you and then it will seem fluid and you will be hard to hit because you're used to doing it practice is key with all aspects of this kind of thing how to heal as Anna when your teammates move randomly and get out of line of sight all the time. If they're getting out of line of sight all the time, there's very little you can do about it. You can like hu you can like point at them and push the I need healing button, in which case it tells them to come to you for healing. But um, if they're going out of line of sight all the time, that sucks. Like, there's not an Anna specific problem. That's like every healer pl has that problem. I play Moira, I fucking hate that shit. Motherfucker, come back around this corner, I'm trying to heal you. Just, if they're doing that, like, there's not much you can do. You can tell them to come back, but if they don't come back, there's not much you can do about it. Um, and if they're moving randomly, I don't know what to tell you. I, like, it's not going to sound helpful, but it's going to be aim better. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not helpful advice, but that's, like, it's legitimately just aim better. Um, don't panic. Like, the, I know, like, this happens with aiming in general, but it could be particularly true with Anna, where you have to heal and shoot other people as well. Like, just don't panic, because, like, as soon as you start panicking and overthinking it, it becomes harder. Just, like, if you find yourself missing a lot on any hero in general, right, you're fighting somebody and you feel yourself missing constantly, just, like, stop, take a breath, and just, like, calm down. Because the, the main reason people's aim is bad is usually just because they're panicking and they're not calm. Just, like, chill. This is why lower sensitivities are helpful as well, because you don't want to be, like, every little movement of your mouse is, like, um, picked up on. Because, like, if you're fidgeting around all the time, that's just going to make it harder to hit people. And if you're, like, panicking while you're doing it, you'll fidget more. This is why, like, you watch somebody, uh, you watch, like, a really good Widowmaker player, they just, like, really slowly, like, and, like, it just seems so fluid and natural, because they're not panicking over it, right? They just, like, just, like, calm down, be chill about it. Don't worry. Um, don't psych yourself out is the moral of the story. So we've gone through two pages, and that's a pretty long video, so we're going to call it there. So uh, thank, you no thank you very much for watching. If you did, please let me know if you enjoyed this and if it's worth doing again in the future. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. More than happy to answer. Join our Discord if you want. You can have like a more direct, uh, direct conversation or ask questions or just shitpost with us as we usually do. And I hope you found the video helpful.